जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री यद्वैरगधाधर शिवचति गौर भक्त वृंदा हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे श्री कृष्णार्पणमस्तु हरि 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 So, Akrura has gone to advise Dhritarashtra, attempting to avoid trouble. Um, so, meanwhile, we will keep Akrura there, go to Jarasandha, the siege of Mathura. Kamsa had two wives by name Asti and Prapti. <laughs> Asti and Prapti. They were the daughters of Jarasandha, the powerful ruler of Magadha. When their lord Kamsa was killed by Krishna, these two queens of the dead king went to Magadha and related to their father about the happenings at Madura and about the killing of Kamsa by Krishna. Highly incensed by this news, Jarasandha decided to rid the earth of the entire Yadava clan. So he collected a huge army. It was made up of 23 Yakshohinis, which surrounded the city of Mathura on all sides. So Krishna saw what was happening. He saw the army, which was like an ocean of men, and this army was covering up all the city on all the sides. City of Mathura was so small that people were panic-stricken when they realized what was happening. Krishna had several thoughts on his mind. He had to make up his mind about the cause of action. He thought to himself, Shall I kill only Jarasandha? without killing the army. Now, this is possible. Less bloodshed, let me finish this guy off. Or, shall I command the entire army after that? Or, shall I destroy both together? Thought for a while and told himself, I have come down to this earth assuming the form of Krishna solely for the purpose of lessening the burden of the earth. It is but me that I destroy the army and not Jarasan. He will then come again and again. I will keep destroying his army. When the time comes, we will take a decision. Krishna and Rama decided to fight and destroy the army and let the master return to the kingdom unharmed. Even as they were discussing the matter, the brothers saw two chariots which appeared before them from the heavens. They were as glorious as the sun and the charioters looked like being from the other world. All the equipments for fighting were placed in the chariots and the charioters came and stood before Rama and Krishna after saluting them. Krishna said, My dear brother Rama, these chariots have been sent to us to have all the weapons necessary for us. Therefore, ask you to take up arms against this ocean of men. We know the purpose for which we have taken this, but let us destroy this arm. Dressed in the garb of warriors ready to fight in the forefront, the two men sallied forth out of the city for the fight. The army was very small and meager compared to the one that faced him. Krishna's charioteer was called Daruka, and when they came out into the open, Krishna blew on his conch, which he had acquired, called Panchajanya. The sound of the conch filled the minds of the enemy host with fear. 
It was a fearful sound. Soon as they heard the conch, the army said, what is happening? Where is this sound coming from? Doesn't sound like a conch. Jarasandha saw Krishna for the first time. He came near and said, oh, so you are Krishna. You are the lowest of the low. <laughs> Killer as you are of your own uncle. I do not like to fight with a sinner like you. It is beneath my dignity. I am ashamed to fight with a person, a coward like you. Go back into the city. As for you, Balarama, if you can muster up enough courage to fight with me, you can. When your body is split by sharp arrows, you will surely reach the heavens, reserved for heroes. There is, of course, alternative and that you may kill me. Yes. Krishna interrupted them and said, You are a king. And you should know by now that real heroes do not brag about their prowess, but show it in action. You are, however, forgiven because you are fast approaching your end and a dying man is apt to talk in a disjointed manner. The fight began in a dry earnest. The entire citizens of Madhuri, <laughs> Masura, who stood on the terraces of their houses, could see nothing but the red cloud. They could not see Krishna or Rama, nor could they see their chariots. In the meantime, Rama and Krishna, bent on destroying the army, were bent on destroying them in a systematic manner. They went round the ocean of men and started finishing the army from the sides. By right now, Jarasandha lost his army, his chariot and his chariot. Balarama grabbed him in his arms. Krishna, however, did not wish for the death of Jarasandha. Therefore, said to his brother, let him go. Jarasandha was beside himself with grief and anger. Grief that his invasion had proved fruitless. And anger because these two youngsters had vanquished the army. Invasion had proved fruitless. Anger at these two youngsters grew up in him. They were so able to vanquish his army so easily. Not only that, one of them nearly killed him. And the other, taking pity on him, had let him go. This is, it was Krishna who had spared him his life. Krishna, whom he had called a coward and a sinner, but he did not appreciate the gesture of Krishna. He felt highly insulted and he could not forgive the two brothers easily. He went back to Magadha. Insult was still rankling in his heart. Several of his friends comforted him, saying that you should have been defeated by these youngsters it's not because you are lacking in bravery, but because fate was against you. Don't be depressed about this. Jarasandha could not be comforted. He decided to perform tapasya, build up more energy and strength, and come back to fight. Krishna, in the meantime, went back to Mathura. He had killed Kamsa and now the two valiant brothers have sent back Jarasandha after destroying his army. There was great joy in the heart of everyone. City had a festive appearance and everyone was happy. Jarasandha, however, would not let them rest in peace. Seventeen times he invaded the city of Mathura and with his many Akshohinis, 
Seventeen times his army was destroyed fully and his life was spared. Every time the humiliation was felt intensely by Jarasandha, but he would not give up. If people do sadhana this way, it will be great. And so things stood until he found another person who was ready to help him fight the Yadavas. Kalayavana. The eighteenth time, Jarasandha collected a fresh army, was on his way to the siege of Mathura. This is the eighteenth time. On the way, he met a powerful king by name Kalayavana. This Kalayavana considered himself to be undaunted. And when he heard about the many humiliating defeats which Charasanda had at the hands of the Yadava brothers, he decided to help him. He promised to augment the army with his own, which was made of three crores. He was fighting with a foreign army. Three crores of mlechas, which means people on the other side of the sea. Mathura was surrounded by the immense Mlecha army of Kalevana. For the first time in the series of sieges, Krishna and Rama forced to think about what to do now. Hmm? Krishna said, look, dear brother, Yadavas are surely in great trouble. There is a foreign collaboration going on. <laughs> We are now surrounded by the enemy on all sides. Kalevana is reputed to be a powerful fighter and he has teamed up with Jarasandha. There is a possibility that these two together may take the Yadavas as captives. We may kill our kinsmen. I suggest that we build a city in the middle of the sea and transport our people to the new city where they will be safe. We will then kill Kalevan. Balrama thought it was a very good suggestion. Krishna then summoned Vishwakarma, the architect of the gods, and told him, build a city in the midst of the sea. Artificial island was made. Hmm? So be it, said Vishwakarma. There rose out of the sea a golden city. It was not easily accessible. It was built in the pattern of the city of the gods. Golden spires decorating the houses which lined the wide and beautiful roads, gardens and groves, terraces inlaid with emeralds, corals and moonstones. I think before they were all taken away, there was plenty here. The rose red city with its golden turrets rose up into the sky like the dream of a poet rising out of the mind's eye, the city called Dwaraka. Gifts were sent to the city by the Devas. Indra sent, Indra sent them a complete ready-made hall. Hmm? An assembly hall by name Sudharma. Banabana, the hall was taken and put there, that's all. Hmm? Baruna sent horses which could run as fast as the wind. Kubera sent immense wealth to fill up the coffers of the king. Each one of the gods remembered the Lord Narayana had given them their wealth and their power. Accordingly, they sent all that they could to enrich the city which had been built for Krishna by Vishwakarma. With the power of his yoga, Krishna took all his beloved subjects to the new city. Overnight, the city of Mathura became empty. Krishna then conferred with his brother about the next step. The army of Kalevana had surrounded the city and since it was night, they were all resting. 
Early in the morning, everyone was awake. Instinctly, they looked towards the gates of the city, which they had to invade during the course of the day. The soldiers spotted one young man walking out of the gates of the city. And by the way, he looked hither and thither before taking halting steps. They decided that he was someone who was trying to run away from them. At once they rushed to the presence of Kalyana and said, My Lord, there is a young man at the gates of the city of Mathura. It looks as though he is trying to escape from the city. It is but meet that you should see him for yourself and tell us what we should do. Take a look. Kalevana stepped out of his tent and walked to the spot indicated by his men. Stood rooted to the spot for a while. So beautiful was the appearance of this guy who had walked out. Like the full moon just rising, he stood there handsome like one descended from the heavens. His dark frame was enveloped in his favorite golden silk. On his chest could be seen the large mold Srivatsa. On his neck he was wearing the jewel Kaustuva. His eyes, slightly red at the edges, looked like newly opened lotuses. There was a slight smile on his lips and his ears were gleaming with earrings shaped like fish. Earrings are always shaped like a fish. Kalevana had heard the description of Krishna from Narada and he said, this must be Krishna, Vasudeva. I have heard so much about his prowess. Fortunately for me, he is here now alone, without a single weapon to defend himself. Now is the time to capture him and kill him. My friend Jarasandha, who is on his way, will be pleased. And so will many of Kamsa's friends, who bear this Krishna so much ill will. What did Krishna do? He paused long enough to make sure that he was noticed. What was more important, that he was recognized. Then, as though he were trying to escape unnoticed, he looked all around him with his eyes, darting furtively on all sides, and began to walk away fast towards the open, away from the city, from which he seemed to be running as fast as he could. Kalaivana did not have a weapon in his hand, and he began to follow Krishna. Krishna looked back, and now he began to run, as though he was fleeing for his life. Uh, Kalevana, short form Yavana, also ran faster, saying, Stop, you coward! You are said to be a brave youngster, as what I have heard. You are said to have killed Kamsa with your bare hands. And Jarasandha has fought with you often and has been defeated, I know. And yet I find you be different from the picture I have formed of you. Hmm? Why is he running? It's one of the arts of guerrilla warfare to run. A place where the enemy follows you then. Hmm. So Krishna has one of the favorite names of Krishna is Ranchod, one who ran away from the battlefield. <laughs> so anyway, so running away from the battlefield in order to conquer is not a bad idea. Running is good, given so as to conquer. Hmm. Anyway. Yet I find you to be different from the picture I formed of you. If you had courage enough, come and fight with me. See, I have no weapons. Come and wrestle with me. Do you think I belong to the class of Chanura and Mushtika? No, no, I am made of iron. 
it will not be so easy to kill me. Perhaps that is why you are running away from me. All the time he increased his speed. And it seemed as though Krishna was within his reach. The great rishis and the yogis have also tried this. Running in great speed, they run greater speed. They think they have just kept was gone. Same. Hmm? All the time, he increased his speed. And it seemed as though Krishna was within his reach. Krishna, the Parabrahman, who is beyond the reach of the greatest of yogis, pretended to be within the reach of Kalayavana. This Yavana thought, I've got him. Suddenly, like a deer which runs away from danger in the form of a tiger, Krishna ran with frightened eyes and flying locks. Run, Chodhya. With a loud laugh, Kalayavana followed him and said, You are such a tender young boy. You make me think of a young sapling in my queen's garden. I almost wish I did not have to kill you. But I have known how deceptive your appearance is. I am nearing the end of my quest. A few moments more and you will be within my clutches. You can't escape me. So the race went on. I think Kalayavana forgot that he has come for a war. Now it became a race. Krishna eluding his grasp, tantalizing, near and frustratingly distant. So they had now travelled quite some distance. Then they reached the end of the path they had been following. Ahead of them was a mountain. And Krishna, to the great amusement of Kalayavana, looked around desperately. He saw a cave and running towards it, he revealed his intention. Oh, this is your plan, said Yavana. Do you think you can escape from me by hiding in that cave? Vishnu ran and disappeared into the cave. A few moments later, Kalevana entered the cave. For a moment he could see nothing. So dark was it inside the cave. After a while his eyes got adjusted to the darkness. Then he looked round for Krishna. He could not see him. First of all, he dark. He searched for a few moments. And a few feet away from him, he saw a form. And that form was lying flat, as though it was sleeping. And his face could not be seen. Kalayavana said, I do not know why people talk so highly of you. Actually, you are very stupid, Krishna. Do you think I will let you go because you are lying down pretending to sleep? Get up and fight with me. Sleeping form would not move. Yavana was annoyed and he was impatient for action. He waited for a while and when he found that his challenge went unheeded, he lost his patience and approaching the sleeping form said, soft words will not wake you up. This is the only way to wake you up. And shooting the action to the words, he kicked the sleeping Krishna. Sleeping form stirred and slowly opened his eyes and looked all round to see who had disturbed his sleep. It was not Krishna. Even as he realized it, Kalayavana found the eyes of the stranger resting on him. They were red with anger and fire sprang out of them. The next moment, 
Kala Yavana was a heap of ashes. Right? Krishna ran and ran and ran, led him into a dark cave, disappeared, brought him on top of a proper mine which burst and he died. King Parikshit interrupted Sukha in his characteristic way and asked him, I am amazed to hear that a sleeper awakened should have the power to burn up the powerful Kalayavana. Who was he, my lord? What was his strength that he could use his eyes like my lord Mahadeva did when he saw Kama, Kamadeva? What was his ancestry? Why was he sleeping in the cave? Sukadeva said, In the Krita Yuga, there was a great monarch by name Mandata. The sleeping man was the son of Mandata. His name was Muchukunda. And he was a jewel in the solar line of things. This Muchukunda. A great man, a great fighter, Ruler, righteous king, was very much loved by the devas and by everyone. The devas were particularly fond of him. For a long period of time, this Muchukunda was fighting with the asuras, along with the devas, and was successful in protecting them. Then what happened? Kumara, the son of Mahadeva, was made the commander of the heavenly host and the devas came to the earthly king Muchukunda. Indra said, My dear friend, we do not know how best to reward you for having been our helper for so many years. Since Kumara is now born to help us and lead us to victory, we feel that we can relieve you of your responsibility. You can go now. But we have done you a great injustice. During the years you served a cause, the earth has changed so much that you may not be able to recognize your own city. The sons whom you appointed to guard the land during your absence are all dead. Your kinsmen, your mentors, your preceptors and your citizens are all gone, lost in the huge cauldron called time. And they have lost their enmity. No, sorry, lost in the huge cauldron called time and therefore have lost their entity. Wise as you are, it is not necessary to tell you that the Lord in the form of time destroys everything. Since you have lost your everything because of us, we are prepared to grant you any boon except moksha which is not in our hands. They always don't have moksha with them to offer. That can be granted only by Narayana. This much we can. Other things, tell us. What do you want? Muchakunda could not grasp it at all in a single moment. All that he knew were two things. One was the fact that there was nothing left for him on the earth. No bond, no desire to pull him back to his kingdom. Other fact was, he was tired. Unbelievably, immensely tired. That was foremost in his mind. He said, look, you all go, all I want is to sleep. You know, you must be thinking, I worked for these guys all these years. They won battles. And now, they are saying, if you go back, there is nothing left, everybody's dead. Where will I go back to? He got fed up of the whole thing. You know how sometimes? So he said, Look, all I want is sleep. Please grant me the boon that I will sleep for a long, long time, a very long time, undisturbed by anything. Grant me also this, that one who disturbs my sleep and wakes me up will at once be burned to ashes. Give me that boon also. 
Who knows when I'm sleeping, some guy might come and wake. I don't want to finish him off. So be it, said Indra. Added, you can rest assured that the one who will be foolish enough to wake you up will be burnt at once by the fire from your sleepy eyes. Mochukunda entered the cave. He had been sleeping there throughout Krita Yuga and Treta Yuga. <laughs> Two Yugas he had slept. Dwapara had almost come to an end. Krishna wanted to grant moksha to Muchkonda. The moksha that he had wanted long ago, which the devas could not give him, and which he deserved so richly. He also knew that the only way to kill Kala Yavana was to have him destroyed with the angry eyes of Muchkonda. So both things matched. Muchkonda was now fully awake. He looked up. First he had burnt that, whatever beetle which came to him. Fully awake, he looked up and saw before him a heavenly form, dark as a rain-bearing cloud, with golden-hued silk covering him, with the Sri Vatsa staining his chest, with the Kastuba on his chest, the many jewelled necklace named Vaijayanti adorning his neck, with four arms holding the Shankh Chakra Gada and Padma, and with the face, said infinite grace flowing from it, with his face glowing because of the earrings flashing in his ears, with a gentle smile hovering on his lips, with a handsomeness which had never before been seen by him and with glory radiating from him. Mpukunda stood up with folded hands and said, a question which Rishis have asked over and over again, who are you? <laughs> you seem to be a divine being in this lonely spot where even thorns are as sharp as arrows. How could your lotus feet walk up to this cave? They are too tender. You seem to be the light which illumines light itself. Are you the god of fire, Agni? Are you Surya, the sun? Oh no, I am wrong. self illumined as you are, you must be one of the three murtis. Now, even if you say in Sanskrit, it is Trimurtis. You cut the three short, it is Trimurtis. Right? Brahma, Vishnu or Shiva, who among them is? No, I am still wrong. You know that. You are Lord Narayana. Now I know. I am a poor mortal. I was a king belonging to the race of the sun. I am the grandson of the fame. Yuvanashwa and my father was Mandata, the monarch. They called me Muchukunda. I rendered some slight service to Indra in the days of old, long ago. As I was very tired, he allowed me to sleep as long as I desired. I was woken up rudely by someone whom I had never seen before. He was reduced to ashes as a result of his own sins, I think. <laughs> then my eyes lighted on you. My Lord, I salute you. Lifting up the prostrate form of Muchkunda, the Lord spoke in a voice resembling the rumbling of a rain cloud. He said, you desire to know who I am, what, what my name is? The names I have used, the births I have taken, the actions I have performed, what, thousands and thousands. They have no beginning and they have no end. One may perhaps be able to count the grains of sand that make up this earth, but not my names and my births and my actions. 
I belong to the past and the present and the future. I am time and as such I am infinite. But let me explain to you the circumstances that led to my coming to you now, at the present moment. Earth is now heavy with the burden of sinful kings, who are asuras born as kings. Adharma is rampant on earth. He therefore went to Brahma, the creator, and he came to me. I promised to help her. There is a dynasty of the moon, and one of the smaller branches of this Chandra Vamsha goes by the name of Yadava. Vasudeva is a Yadava, and I have been born as his son. I am called Krishna. Krishna Vasudeva. I have killed Kamsa, a sinner, and several Asuras. The man you burned with your eyes was a terrible and sinful king by name Kalayavana. I came to this cave because I knew that you were here. You have ever been my bhakta and thought that the time had come for what you are waiting for. I am waiting for you to ask me. I will grant you anything you ask for. None of my bhaktas has been unhappy. Please make your wishes known so I can grant them to you. Now, this is one story. Nowhere did Krishna say that he ran away. Nowhere. He ran actually to free this guy and that guy ran after him and died. <laughs> Muchukunda was speechless for a long time. Tears flowed from his eyes. Twice he tried to talk and twice his voice was choked with emotion. Finally he said, the Lord should grant me something which is not easy to get. Now he did not ask for sleep. Instead of when Indra said, what do you want? He said, please, allow me to sleep. Now he has got up from sleep. He didn't ask for sleep. He asked for awakening. The Lord should grant me something which is not easy to get. As for the pleasures of the earth, they are easy enough to find. Nor will I be led astray by a wish to enjoy them. My Lord, this entire world is deluded by your Maya. Men and women, caught as they are in the whirlpool of desires, do not know the truth about anything. Again and again they become attached, not knowing the danger that is in store for it. Even so, one is, man is deceived by the senses and falls into this pit again and again and again. And this is because his mind is not set on you. His thoughts are not bent on you. Why should I go for an example? Take me, for instance. I was Lord of the world. He said, I shouldn't have to have any other example. I know myself. I was Lord of the world. Raja Lakshmi had showered her favours on me without stinting. And I thought that there was no one equal to me. I was attached to my children, my kingdom, my family. I wasted so much of my life caught up in this web of Maya. I was so busy enjoying myself and the things of this world that I had no time for thoughts of you. I spent my time in making plans, thousands in number and never reckoned on the fact that you are Kala which swallows everything. From the ceiling of the kitchen is hanging a pot filled with butter. Suddenly shifted. From the ceiling of the kitchen there is hanging a pot filled with butter. A rat has been wanting to eat it. Therefore it gets at the top of the rope which is holding the pot. 
and is trying to reach the pot by sliding along the rope. All the while, a snake which has been waiting to eat the rat is licking its chops, waiting to spring on the rat, which is all unconscious of the danger threatening it because his mind, his eyes, everything is fixed on the butter hanging in the pot. Even so, a human being in pursuit of happiness which is earthly does not pay heed to the fact that time is waiting to put an end to him and his desires. The same body which when dressed in silken garments and golden ornaments calls itself the king of the world. This is destroyed by you in the form of Kala. Kala. He then becomes dirt or a host for a number of worms or a heap of ashes. Even at times he is reminded of the fact that he has to die sometime. Man sets his mind on performing penance. And the purpose of the penance? May I become the Lord of the heavens. What happens to him? After the punya he has acquired becomes exhausted. He comes again into this world and the cycle goes on indefinitely. The end of this cycle comes within the sight of one who is blessed by the company of sadhus. The only way out. Wise men who can tell what path he should pursue to get freedom from bondage. They will teach this lesson, one lesson worth learning. Abandoning earthly loves and cleaning ponds, sorry, and setting the mind on the feet of the Lord. You, as for me, I have been fortunate in one thing. By accident, I have been released from bondage which is made up of children and kingdom since I was absent from them long enough to forget them. This, I am sure, is your grace. I ask only one boon of you. I want to serve you and I want a place at your blessed feet. I don't want anything else. Wealth is the form assumed by Rajoguna. Enemies and the desire to fight are forms of Tamoguna. Desire to do good to others, to get a good name donated by so and so, which are the forms which Sattva Guna takes. I want to be rid of all three of them. I surrender myself at your feet since you are without any Guna, any Upadi. You are one. There is no second. You are the knowledge and you are the Parama Purusha. I am tired, my Lord. Didn't he say, I didn't want, he didn't say, I am tired, I want to sleep. I am tired, my Lord. He's tired of sleeping also now. <laughs> of the many births I have gone through in this world of suffering, in spite of so much suffering, the mind still refuses to abandon his involvement with the senses with the six enemies, and because of these, man loses his peace of mind. Please grant me a place at your feet, so that I have no more fear and no more suffering. Krishna said, he heard the whole lecture, standing there in the cave. He didn't say, hey, come out. Krishna said, I am pleased with you and your devotion to me. Even when you are tempted by me, by asking you to name your desire, you did not ask for anything. You will be able to wander the earth with a mind free of all attachment. I assure you that your mind will never stay away from thoughts of me. You have to live some more years on the earth. Since you have to expiate the sins you have committed because of your being a Kshatriya whose dharma is hunting and killing of innocent animals. Once you are dead, you will have only one more birth. 
and during the birth you will not forget me and you will reach me after that muchukunda then emerged out of the cave with krishna krishna took leave of him and went away now muchukunda looked around him found that the world had changed beyond all recognition he had been sleeping for aeons he saw that even the trees and animals have become smaller yes. darwin also said that he realized that kali yuga was fast approaching he turned his steps towards the north to do tapas everybody goes north yeah <laughs> but the He had acquired equanimity, and with a clear mind, he walked and reached the sacred mountain. No, first he did not go there directly. First he went to the Ganda Madana. There he went to the ashrama by name Badrika Ashrama, <laughs> where Nara and Nara and I had performed tapasya long ago. Hmm. Muchkunda settled there, and indifferent to the opposites, he pursued his worship of Narayana. Looks like she's gone to Badri Narayan. <laughs> Muchkunda settled there, and indifferent to the opposites, he pursued his worship of Narayana. till such time as he had to spend on the earth now krishna in the meantime went back happily to mathura nobody knew what had happened balarama and he were now busy destroying the army brought by kalayavana the army did not know that their master was dead while they waited for him they were destroyed krishna looted their wealth and he was transporting that also to the new city of dwaraka jarasandha happy in the thought that kalevana was there to assist him in raiding mathura arrived in the vicinity of the city with his huge army krishna and balarama appeared at the gates of the city and when they saw the large army brought by jarasandha they began to run as fast as if they were fleeing for their lives this is a nice technique <laughs> run well, it happens sometimes you don't want to see anybody the only way left is run for you hmm in some places i am even on rest days i cannot go out because there are always people koi aa raha hai koi ja raha hai like kabir said so what is the best way run <laughs> krishna and balarama appeared at the gates of the city and when they saw the large army brought by jarasandha they began to run as fast as if they were fleeing for their very lives he was shocked he was taken aback by his behavior of these two brothers he was unlike them usually they came forward and said oh come on let's have a fight they're running out of character because they remembered how they fought other battles this sudden cowardice one unexpected he thought it was cowardice however was no time to speculate he saw that they were without weapons and they were running from him as fast as their legs could carry them he gave them chase seated in the chariot army followed him the chase went on for a long time imagine them running in front and the whole army following the two boys could be seen all the while they finally reached the foot of the mountain by name pravarshana it was always wet with rain since indra was partial to this mountain 
Krishna and Rama ran to the top of the hill with their steps covering the slopes fast. Suddenly they disappeared from the view of Jarasandha. Such party was formed. And Magadav himself tried his level best to locate the hiding place of the youngsters. He could not. He said, they should not escape from me. Surround the mountain on all sides. Let my enemies burn in the conflagration, set fire to the forest. Let me wipe the tears of my daughters who suffered widowhood because of them. Fire rolled on all sides. And from the side nearest to the sea, Rama and Krishna jumped down on the ground. From there, without being noticed, the enemy went safely to the city of Dwaraka. Parikshit interrupted again. He said, no, no, forget about this for the time being, sir. Told Sukha, why did Krishna lead Kalevana into the cave where Muchukunda was sleeping? Why did he make the king of the solar rays burn him? when he could have killed him himself. Krishna could have done it easily, considering the number of asuras he has finished, even as a child. Please let me know the reason for this manure of Krishna, because there must be some reason. Sukha Brahma said, Your guess is right, but it is a long story. There was once a large gathering of the Yadavas. Two great rishis, Shayala and the family priest of the Yadavas, the family priest of the Yadavas, and Gargya, another great man, were both there. While the conversation was going on, there was suddenly an argument between the rishis. The talk became heated. And before anyone could intervene, Gargya said that he had been insulted by Shaila. And the Yadavas wanted to know what exactly were the words spoken by Shaila. And the Yadavas wanted to know what exactly were the words spoken. Gargya said, this guy called me an eunuch. Imagine, among rishis. <laughs> Shayala then called Gargya, hey, you eunuch. Thoughtlessly, the Yadavas laughed <laughs> when they heard it. And this made the rishi more angry. He walked out of the hall. He went straight to a mountain top and performed a severe tapasya to please Lord Mahadeva. Twelve years passed, and the Lord, pleased with his devotion, appeared before him and asked him what he desired. Gargya said, I want the Yadavas, Yadavas to be punished. I want a son of whom they will be scared. For this purpose, I have been consuming powdered iron as my daily food. I also want to prove that I am not an eunuch, which was the word Chayala used when he insulted me. Mahadeva was sad that so much tapasya was used for such a paltry purpose. <laughs> but he had promised to grant him anything he had desired. He therefore said, okay, so be it and vanished from the sight of Gargya, who came back to civilization with a glad heart. There was a king named Yavanesha who had no children. He prayed in vain for an heir to the throne. He then went to the Rishi Gargya, and was the custom in those days, beseeched him to grant him a child. How? He said, I couldn't do anything. Please take my wife, my queen. Trishi agreed to do so. Advantage is it will be a Rishi Putra also. 
and he took the wife of the king. Course of time, a son was born to Yavanesha's queen. He was dark as a beetle. He was named Kalayavana. Krishna could easily have killed Kalayavana. He had to fulfill the prophecy that the Yadavas would be afraid of the son of Gargya. That was why he built the city by name Dwaraka. That was the reason for his leading the ill-fated Kalevana to the cave where Muchukunda was sleeping so that he would be the one to kill the king. Also, Krishna wanted to grant moksha to Muchukunda who had been sleeping for so long. The many kings whom the Lord had promised to destroy had to be killed one by one. Kamsa led the long procession of the kings who were killed. Kalayavana was the next to go. Before he went back to the glory, that is, his, the Lord kept his promise to Mother Earth and one by one and altogether the sinful kings were sent to the board of death by Krishna. Some he finished off himself. Some others, he made others finish them off. In the Kurukshetra Va, the main purpose of his birth, Krishna was just the charioteer of Arjuna. And he made a promise that he would not touch a single weapon. And that was the occasion when he destroyed almost the entire Shatya clan. Strange are the ways of the Lord. We can but listen to the stories and be thrilled by them. The purpose of it all is but a glimmer in the distance. But we are almost always in the dark as to the why of many things. The country of Vidarbha was ruled by a king named Bhishmaka. Not Bhishmaka. He was a good man saintly, God-fearing, and ever interested in doing good to others. He had six children. Five of them were sons, and the youngest was a daughter. Rukmi was the eldest son. And Rukmaratha, Rukmabahu, Rukmakesha, and Rukmamali were the four sons. The daughter was called Rukmini. Rukmini was a favorite of them all. But to her father, she was particularly a pet. He would always have her by his side, even when he was attending to the affairs of the state. The little girl would sit on the same seat with him and with her wide open eyes would look at everyone and everything. She was the darling of the palace and her will was never thwarted. She was a pet of everyone, and they waited on her like servants. King Bhishmaka was a saintly man, and he reveled in listening to the words of saintly men. He would spend days and months in the company of the rishis and other holy men who would visit him often. He would listen for hours together on the discourses on Vedanta, and on similar topics, and all the while Rukmani would also sit by his side and listen to all. So what is the what happened? She learned everything by listening. One of the frequent visitors was Narada, the son of Brahma. Every time he came, he would sit and talk about Krishna. I'm sure he knew what's happening. The old king Bhishmaka had heard again and again about the prowess of Krishna, his handsomeness, his sweet nature, his love for those who were devoted to him, his divinity. The king was never tired of listening to the many qualities of Krishna, nor was Narada tired of relating them. All the while, Rukmuni would sit by the side of her father, listen to the words of Narada. Years passed. From being a child, Lukmini had now grown up into a beautiful woman and her father had to think of a marriage. To him, 
Krishna seemed to be the perfect choice. Imagine, the king is thinking. Even after hearing from Narada all this, he thought perfect choice would be Krishna. He would be the ideal husband for his darling child Rukmini. Rukmi was the eldest son and the king spoke to him about the idea he had about the marriage of Rukmini. He said, Rukmini's wedding has to be performed soon. She has grown into womanhood, like most parents. Girl has to be married. My son, I have chosen a good husband for her. So, you have saved me the trouble, said Rukmi with a laugh. But who is it, father? Krishna, son of Vasudeva, said the king. Before he could finish the sentence, Rukmi sprang up from his seat. Are you mad, father? Krishna, indeed, I will not allow such a thing. Rukmi, why did he say that? Because he was a great friend of Jarasandha and Kalayavana. They were great friends who had died during the last siege of Mathura. His other friends were all the same caliber. Paundraka, Viduratha, Salva, Dantavakra, Shishupala, the son of Damagosha. All of them were confirmed haters of Krishna and Rama. The words of Bhishmaka naturally incensed Rukmi to no end. He went on, Father, my sister is the princess of the kingdom of Vidarbha. And this man you have chosen is not even a vassal king. He was a cowherd in his early days and then he killed Kamsa by foul means. Even then he did not have the courage to take the throne. He killed Kamsa, but he didn't even sit on the throne. Like a tiger covering itself with the skin of a cow, he assumes humility and makes the old man Ugrasena the king. Does he think he's deceiving anybody by this great show of respect for the elders? He is a low-born man. And he assumes roles which do not suit him. I know that he is far inferior to us in position, in wealth and in everything. I do not approve of Rukmini being given to him in marriage. I will not agree with this. Bhishmaka was unhappy at the words spoken by his son. He tried to speak, but his son would not allow him to say a word. Old man had to agree to the words of his son. If you do not approve my choice, who then do you think is worthy of your sister? Yeah. Rukmi said, I have decided long ago that Shishupala, the son of Damagosha, should be the groom for a fair Rukmi. Bhishmaka did not approve of the suggestion at all. He knew about the Shishupala. What an arrogant and vain guy he was, but he could do nothing about it. He therefore agreed to the marriage between the two. Happy in the thought that his father was so easy to manage, Rukmi made haste to make all the arrangements for the wedding of his sister Rukmi. Rukmini sends a messenger. Rukmini was broken hearted. Days and years she had been listening to the stories of Krishna. She had in her mind given away her heart to him long ago. She had chosen him as a lord and when she heard from her maid that her father had decided to give her to Krishna, her thrill was great. Now she realized that her dream might have to end just as dreams do. She remembered the words of Narada who told her about the beauty of Krishna, about his great bravery even as a child, 
of his magnetism which drew everyone to him and made them slaves of them. The many lovable qualities which had enslaved her young heart. The decision of Rukmi seemed irrevocable since it had always been the rule in the house that his words had to be obeyed. Rukmini thought to herself, my brother has made up his mind. He has not even thought of asking me if I approve. As for the Lord whom I have chosen, hmm? surely he must have known how it is with me. He knows everything. How could he not know that Rukmani has chosen him as her Lord since long ago? Knowing this, he has not made any attempt um, to take me. Evidently, he does not love me when he loves some other woman who is more fortunate than I am. I have been told that he was loved by so many women when he was in Vrindavan. This story always has preceded him. What shall I do now? I cannot touch another man even with my thoughts since my heart is given to Krishna. I will marry him or else I will give up my life. I am not able to tell my mother or others about this since it is improper behavior on my part. I have made up my mind. There is only one way open to me. I will have to tell him that I love him and ask him to save me. This I can. I will send word to him. I have been told that he has never abandoned those who have surrendered themselves to him. Shyness is no place where the situation is critical. Hmm? I will send a word to him to save me from this danger. If he does not do so, I will kill myself. Very simple. But I will never accede to my brother's wishes. So she pondered for a long time till she came to this decision. There used to come to the palace apartments an old Brahmin. Rukmani had known him for a long time. Ever since she could remember, he would always spend some time with her, talking to her. She decided that she would send him to Krishna with a message. She felt that he would keep her secret. Well, and he would do it for her. Fortunately, even as she was thinking of him, he came to the inner apartments and greeted Rukmini. Seeing her sad face, the old man said, My dear child, what is making you so unhappy? Tell me. So she told him. He saw the tears in her eyes and said, Krishna will not abandon you to this dreadful fate, I am sure. He will take care of his bhaktas. Rukmani said, generalizations are not enough, good friend. I want you to do something for me. <laughs> Simply saying, oh, he will save. What the heck? Tell me what I should do and I will certainly do anything to wipe those tears from your eyes. Rukmani told him what she wanted him to do and gave him the message to be given to Krishna. She said, Krishna is said to be fond of Brahmins and he will always receive them with great respect. You need have no fear of going to his presence as soon as you reach his palace. So this man took leave of her and hurried in the direction of Dwaraka. Dwaraka, the rose red city. Perhaps it was the urgency of his mission or perhaps it was the witchery or witchcraft of Krishna. But the old man was surprised to find himself in Dwaraka very soon. He sensed to where the house was, where Krishna lived, and he hurried towards it. Doorkeepers received him with respect and led him to the inner apartments. 
The old man looked up and there on the seat of gold sat Krishna, the Lord of Lord. So overcome was the Brahmin with emotion, he could not speak. Stood there with his eyes drinking in the beauty of Krishna. Krishna got up quickly from his seat, coming towards him, touched his feet, asked for his blessings. The Lord. He then led the guest to the seat where he was sitting. He waited on him himself and making him refreshed after the journey. Krishna made him partake of food, asked him to rest. Nothing is happening till now. After he had rested for a while, Krishna pressed his feet with his lotus hands and said, My Lord, are the people in your country righteous? Are the likes of you allowed to pursue your duties without any trouble? Are the people contented in the country where you come from? If a Brahmin has this one quality, that of saying, what I have is enough, and does not aspire for many things, he will have no cause to be unhappy. If, however, there is no contentment in the heart, then even if he is given the honour of being Indra, he will not be happy. To me, the people worthy of worship are those who are contented with what they have. You are ever bent on the knowledge of the Atman, who would never swerve from Dharma, which is theirs, who are without ego, or even tranquil under all circumstances. Such people are found only in the country where the ruler is righteous. Is your king good to you? Is he walking in the path of dharma? If so, he is dear to me. You have come to see me. From a distance you have come, I can see. Crossing so many rivers and forests, he didn't utter a single word about Rukmini, didn't he? If you can tell me what I can do for you, I will do it gladly. If it is no secret, then tell me what has made you undertake such a long and tiresome journey at this age. It is an age when you should rest and not tire yourself. Please tell me, if it is not a breach of confidence, why you came? If you have noticed throughout the Bhagavad, when elders, rishis and others go, you find this person in this character in Bhagavad, who is referred to as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, gets down and touches the feet, takes the dust from their feet, puts it on his head, washes their feet, massages their feet. This distinguishes an avatar. He doesn't say, oh, sit there. I'm asking you something. Shut up. You know? <laughs> so please tell me. The Brahmin was charmed with the words of Krishna. He said, you are the Lord of the entire universe. They say, now this they say is very good. Even the Rishis and the Upanishads said, Iti Shushrum Appur Vesham, so they said. Hmm? You are the Lord of the entire universe, they say. There is nothing which you do not know. And yet, since you have honoured me so much and asked me why I have come, I'm only happy to tell you. I come from the country by name Vidarbha. Kundanapura is the city, is the chief city. And the country is ruled by the righteous king Bhishmaka. He has a daughter whose name is Rukmini. Here the Brahmin passed. and looked at Krishna, as if to say, have you heard of her? 
Krishna had a gentle smile on his lips and he said nothing. Vamin continued to talk. He said, the king has also five sons and the eldest of them is known as Rukmi. The king, feeling that his daughter is of marriageable age, considered that you are a worthy person and decided to give his daughter to you. Again he passed. Krishna had a gleam in his eyes and he said, Me? <laughs> he wants to give his daughter to me. But then no one has approached me as yet, nor has my father received any message from Vidarbha. So are you the emissary that the king has sent? Bhaman said, No. Things are not so easy to manage there. The king wanted to give his daughter to you, but his son would not let him do so. He wants his sister to wed Shishupala, the son of Dhamagosha, he is the lord of the Chedi country. Krishna's face assumed a serious look. I have heard very ill-favoured reports about Shishupala. The king agreed for this marriage. He had to, said the Brahmin, because Rukmi is a powerful prince and his word is law. And so where do I come in, said Kai. <laughs> With a mischievous look. Rukmini, my lord, said the Brahmin, has ever been in love with you. Ever since she was a child, I have known her and she has told me how much she loves you. And to a Patibhritha like her, this news is poison. She is heartbroken. She is desperate. And she has sent you a message through me. She asked me to hurry as much as I could and deliver it to you. I will relate it to you and the rest is in your hands. Rukmani's message. Rukmani's love letter. The old Brahman sat up straight and Krishna sat with his eyes wide open to listen to the message of Rukmani. She didn't write. She spoke to him and said, repeat it. Achyuda Krishna, <laughs> you are the most handsome person in the entire world. So I have been told. I have heard about your many noble qualities, that you are compassionate towards those who are devoted to you. I have heard about your looks, your greatness, your nobility, and all these I have heard from great rishis like Narada. My years have been for a long time drinking in these. Anybody wants to write a love, please listen. <laughs> Nicely written. My years, not for me, huh? okay. <laughs> My years have been for a long time drinking in these words. And my mind is lost in you. I feel no shame in telling you of my love for you. Is it surprising that a woman should love you who has all these qualities? Perhaps you may think that a high-born maiden like me is lacking in decorum when I approach you with my love. Mukunda, how can anything else be possible? How can I help it? How can I help loving you? As for me, I am a brave woman and I am intelligent. I am also possessed of good qualities, self-promotion. I am <laughs> born in a noble family. In every way, I am your equal and a fitting wife to you. And you are the only man fit to take me. You are generous, born in a noble line, capable, well-versed in the fine arts, and the arts which please a woman. You are young and rich. Your patience and your sweet nature are known the world over. You are ever full of affection for others and the praises heaped on you are countless. 
how then can a woman like me not help choosing you as a lord? You must take me and make me yours. Straightforward. Please do not let a small-minded mean jackal touch what is meant for a lion. <laughs> the prince of Chedi, who has been chosen by my brother, should not even touch me, not even with his thoughts. Make me yours before he sees me. Whether you will take me or not, will soon be made known to me by the messenger that I have sent. But remember, my Lord, please remember, I have performed severe penances in my own way to make you accept me. I have performed charitable deeds, again, some promotional. I have worshipped fire and I have given away gold and other gifts to deserving people. I have performed ritas and have ever been paying respect to elders and brahmins. All these acts of mine must grant me my wish, and not this son of Damagosha. It is only the hope of you accepting my love that is keeping me alive. If by chance you do not come, and this man touches me, I will die consumed by the fire of separation from you. Your lotus eyes will ever be in my mind's eye when I die. I will not be unhappy. Why? Because I will take your lotus eyes with me when I die. Only you have to suffer. <laughs> Finally, because of the stigma attached to your name, that you did not save your devotee, who had surrendered her everything to you. Perhaps you are wondering about the means by which I should be taken away. <laughs> that also. Well carefully planned. You may be saying, Rukmini, <laughs> your father and brother have already made up their minds about the man who is to have you. The marriage is to take place in two days. There is so little time. How then can I do what you ask me to do? You would say that. But I know that you are invincible. In this entire world, there is no one equal in prowess. Please come to our city. A day before the wedding, all planned. Then, with your army, you can destroy this Shishupala and Jarasandha and take me away forcibly in the manner known as a Rakshasa wedding. <laughs> I do not have to tell you that among the Kshatriyas, when the maiden's people do not approve of the man she has chosen, this is the method in which marriages are conducted. If you don't know, you may have another doubt. For the sake of carrying you away, I will have to enter the chamber set apart for women, Nantapura, and hurt innocent women and guards. Is it right? I have a solution for that. <laughs> On the day before the wedding, there is a custom that the bride would leave the Antapura and come out into the open. While auspicious instruments make music, she will have to walk to the temple of Devi Parvati and pray to her. The temple is quite some distance from the palace. Hmm? When I have come out of the palace, it will be easy for you to take me away. Even when everyone is looking on, great sadhus want, but the dust of your feet, to cure them of their tamoguna. It is that very dust which will keep me alive. If, however, I do not achieve my heart's desire, I will abandon my body, which is already wasted by fasts and pratas. I will die with the hope that you will take me at least in my next janma, or if that fails, in the next. 
hundreds of births may pass, but finally you will be my Lord. Till then, I pray for your grace and I wait for it. First she said how to take her away. Now I will wait for countless janmas and pray for it. Please do not abandon me, who is ever devoted to you, whose life depends on you. Message is over. He took the hands of the Brahmin in his hands, smiled at him. Then he said, I am not shy to tell you that I have been in love with Rukmini. Go and tell her. For the last so many years, it's going on. <laughs> Just as she has heard about me and my qualities and loved me for them, I have done the same. Narada described her to me. <laughs> Everywhere there is this Narada. Narada described her to me. He has told me that she glows like gold. Her hair is dark like a beetle. Narada, can you imagine sitting and saying? Her face is like the full moon and her eyes are wide and beautiful like that of a stricken deer. Her nose is small and straight. Her teeth are like a string of jasmine buds. Her smile is captivating. Her ears are like shells and her voice is like that of a nightingale. Her neck is white and beautiful like a conch. Her lips are more red than the bimba fruit. Her red feet are soft and her soft palms bear auspicious signs like the shankha and the chakra. Her waist is small. <laughs> Parikshina madhe. Her waist is very small and her thighs are soft and straight like the trunk of a plantum tree. <laughs> her hips are large and beautiful. She walks like a swan and her face is ever smiling. Now this poor old man is listening. <laughs> Ever since I heard the words of Narada, I have been wanting to take her hand. Narada also told me that her father was planning to give her to me. Now, even before she told me, I have heard that her brother's hatred for me has caused a change of plans and ever since then I have not been able to sleep properly at nights. I look at my eyes. Are they not red? Can you not see the, that they are tired? Krishna paused for a while to see if it was, effect was happening. And then said, I will this very moment destroy those sinful men who disgrace the Kshatriya caste to which they belong. I will snatch the beautiful Princess Rukmini under their very eyes and bring her back with me to Dwaraka. I will not abandon Rukmini whose heart is already mine. Krishna knew that he had very little time since the marriage was decided to take place in two days. Krishna called for his chariot to Daruka and told Daruka, Daruka, get my chariot ready. I must leave immediately. Krishna's favorite horses, Shaibya, Shugriva, Meghapushpa and Malahaka were soon yoked and Daruka brought the chariot to the door and stood and said, Chariot is ready. Krishna helped the old Brahmin also into the chariot and then he ascended it himself. Horses were fleeter than the wind, they traveled all night. Early in the morning, they reached Vidarbha. Balarama, in the meantime, heard that Krishna had left in a hurry for Vidarbha. And he had 
every intention of bringing Rukmini with him. So Balrama guessed there would be some trouble caused by this. So he also hurried to Vidarbha with his arm. Yeah, the war. So now we will see what happens when I come back, go to the toilet and all get ready and come back. Shreem Krishna Ya Govinda Ya Gopi Janavalla Bhaya Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Shri Krishna Arpa Namastu Hare Om So, are you crying for Rukmini? No. Bhishmaka, in the meantime, had, had made all the preparations for the wedding. The city of Kundinapura had a festive look. The streets were sprinkled with scented water and all the houses were decorated with wreaths of flowers. The pillars and the flagstaffs were all gay with flags and banners. All the people were dressed in their silks and every house bore a gay look since their princess was to be married. The palace was a hive of activity. The preparations were endless. The poor were fed. And the Brahmins were honored with feasts and gifts of gold and silk. They were asked to bless the young princess who was to be the bride the next day. The walls were resounding with the chanting of Vedas and the singing of the women who surrounded Rukmini. They dressed her in new clothes, they tied charms, amulets and yellow thread around her wrist to ward off evil eyes. Dhamagosha, the only thing missing, there were no photographers or videographers. Dhamagosha, the king of Chedi, did the same things for his son and brought Shishupala to Vidarbha. He brought a huge army also with him. And they came to the city early enough. Pishmaka received them with honor and took them to their apartments. Palaces set apart for them, which Shishupala had come, Jarasandha, Shalva, Dantavakra, Viduratha and Bondraka were all confirmed enemies of Krishna and all. They had also brought their armies with them. They were all familiar with the fact that Bhishmaka had wanted to give Rukmini to Krishna and that it was the firm voice of Rukmi, their friend, which had averted the calamity. They wanted, therefore, to be there to help Shishupala in case there is a crisis. Now, Balarama also, thinking of this, had brought his army. Rukmini took no interest in the surroundings and in the excitement which was in the heart of everyone. She sat like a puppet while all preparations were going on. Her heart was with Krishna and her mind was clouded since a messenger, the old Brahmin, had not come back from Dwaraka. 
she thought, there is just one night left. Then the day of marriage will follow. Krishna has not come. Nor has the old man. Perhaps Krishna, who was interested in marrying me, suddenly became displeased with me because of my shamelessness in telling him of my love. So perhaps he doesn't want to come. The old man is too fond of me to tell me this and that's why he has not come. I'm sure of it. Or perhaps because of my misfortune, he has come across some obstacle on the way, is hence delayed. Or is it that the gods are angry? And their anger has made me the most miserable among women. Have I been careless in the worship of my God? Even if he is angry with me for some fault of mine, why is Gauri, Parvati, the goddess whom I worship every day, why is she indifferent? By herself she is compassionate. Perhaps her constant association with Rudra <laughs> must have made her also like him in anger. She knows that I am just about to kill myself, yet she does not relent. It is but natural for her. Girija, the daughter of the mountain, to be born with a heart of stone. <laughs> with a mind filled with misgivings like these, Rukmini closed her eyes and sat silent. She comforted herself with the thought that there was still time for Krishna to come. She did not want anyone to see her tears. Closing her eyes, she told herself, let me not despair. Time is not at past. There is still a chance of his coming. I must not die yet. If he comes and finds that I have given up my life, what then? What will he think of my faith in him? Suddenly, Rukmini found her left eye throbbing and her left thigh and her left shoulder were throbbing. All these sudden signs were indicating that something good was happening to her. And she opened her eyes and her heart felt lighter. She had felt that all hope was not lost. Krishna, in the meantime, had arrived at the garden, which was located just outside the outskirts of the city. He asked the Brahmin to go to the palace and tell Rukmini that her troubles were about to end. And that Krishna was in the city. When Rukmini opened her eyes, which were full of tears, she saw someone familiar at the distance. So she quickly wiped her eyes and looked again. No, it was not her imagination. The old man had come. He was approaching her fast. From the smile on his face, she knew that he was bringing good tidings. He had seen her walking up and down the terrace and he saw her sit down with despair right in every moment. He hurried towards her. When she saw him, she questioned him with her eyes. And he could convey to her the message that the Lord was in the city. Very casually, she took him aside, asked him what had happened. He related to her detail of his visit to Dwaraka. And Krishna is confiding in him, and he was also in love with her. Tears flowed from her eyes, and she said, I do not know how to reward you, my friend, for this kind. There is only one thing I can do. She fell at his feet and washed them with her tears. News reached Bhishmaka that Krishna and Rama had arrived in the city. He thought that they had come to join in the wedding celebrations. 
He went to them and offered them milk, honey, costly clothes and gems. In his mind, he had chosen Krishna as the groom. He was not happy at the thought that someone else would take his place. He had honoured Krishna as his would-be son-in-law. He had led them to a very grand apartment and requested them to honour by attending the wedding. Krishna smiled and said, Have no fear. I have come just for that. <laughs> for the wedding of your daughter. Balarama looked serious and the two brothers stayed together long after the old king had left them. They were in a separate place. Citizens heard that Krishna had come to their city with Rama and they rushed to the palace where they were staying to have a look at them. Told themselves, Krishna is the man who should have married Rukmini. See how well they are suited to each other. If at all we have obtained any punya in our previous births, and in this birth, we will offer it all as the price. If only Krishna marries Rukmini. So they spoke. But it was all in whispers, because nobody should hear. They did not dare express their feelings. Since Rukmi was not fond of Krishna and you would punish them, we heard them. The hallowed moment had come. When the princess had to come out of her apartments and proceed to the temple of Parvati, on all sides she was heavily guarded by soldiers with drawn swords. And Rukmini walked with halting steps. With her went her mother and her companions and the royal guard. Her mind fixed on Krishna, her eyes half closed. Rukmini walked as though in a trance. It was a long procession and the women carried the auspicious materials for the worship of Devi. There was music, there was chanting of the Vedas, and the princess reached the temple. She washed her feet and her hands and eyes. Whole Brahmin Shivasinis took her by the hand and led her to the shrine of Parvati. Rukmini prayed, Mother, I salute you again and again. She then worshipped the Devi and performed the puja as was directed by the older women. She received the prasada from them after falling at their feet. Her vow of silence had been broken by her prayer and her jewel fingers holding on to the arm of her companion, she emerged out of the temple. All the princes who had assembled there for the wedding saw her and her immense charm. Her waist was so small, it could not be seen, but for the band of gold which encircled it. The gem set in it pulled the eyes of the beholders to her waist and made them gasp in admiration. With her earrings moving in the breeze, with her eyes like those of a deer, with a smile bright like moonlight, with the gait of a swan, she walked slowly. Those who saw her were faint with too much beauty. Some of them did actually faint. <laughs> Rukmini knew that Krishna was somewhere there. that he would take her away from there. Faint smile hovered on her red lips and there was eagerness in her steps and yet she did not dare to walk fast, it was not done. And again, once she had covered the distance between the temple and the palace, her chance of staying out in the open would be over, gone forever. But her eagerness to see Krishna was overwhelming. In the breeze, her dark curls tended to flutter around her face. With her left hand, she pushed them away. 
and under this pretext she raised her eyes from the ground and looked furtively for a sign of a lord. If she simply looked, everybody would know. So she pretended. At the same time, she felt his presence and looked up. She saw the most divinely handsome man standing on the terrace of a chariot and his right hand was held out to her. He leaned out of the chariot. He grasped her right hand firmly, lifted her bodily and placed her in the chariot. Even as others were looking on, Krishna spurred his horses and drove away from them. Balarama and the Yadava host followed him slowly. Krishna looked like a lion walking away with his prey from the midst of a pack of jackals. For a moment there was silence. Then there was confusion among the kings who had come for the wedding. Salva and Jarasandha and the others could not bear this insult to their friend and said, Shame on us, but we stood helpless while a cowherd walked away with a prize which belongs to a Kshatriya. Soon they were riding on their chariots with their armies following them and tried to overtake Krishna and claim their prince bride to be. But the foresight of Balarama prevented them from doing this. The other army held them at bay and would not let them proceed further. From the terrace of the chariot, Rukmini saw the fight that was going on. Her eyes were scared. Do not be afraid. Enemies will soon be rooted by your army. Her face was red with shyness and she would not look up at Krishna, who she knew was looking at her with a smile in his eyes. She looked down. After all this tamasha. <laughs> Soon the kings had to admit defeat and returned crestfallen. Jarasandha had led the others <coughs> in the retreat. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and they went to Shishupala. He was looking like a rich man who had suddenly lost all his wealth. He looked so unhappy and again his face was dark with anger and disappointment and he looked at his friends with questioning eyes. They shrugged their shoulders. Jarasandha said, forget your worries, friend. Nothing is permanent in this world, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. One has to act according to the situation. He should continue his actions indifferent to all this. Man is, after all, but helpless puppet in the hands of fate, Jarasandha, and so on. Let us wait. Soon things will change. Someday the fates will favor us, and then we will be on top. They will be the losers. Not comforted one bit by these dry words of comfort which his friend spoke, Shishupala returned to his country, since there was nothing else to do. So somebody who was very happy, Bhishmaka, was extremely happy at the turn of events. Rukmi's anger was terrible. He collected one Akshovini and went in the direction in which Krishna went. He took one battalion with him. He was bent upon killing Krishna. Before leaving, he took his bow in his hand and took an oath. I swear that I will not return to the city of mine until I kill Krishna and rescue Rukmini. He ordered his charioteer to go fast and overtake Krishna. Perhaps Krishna anticipated his coming. His chariot was going slowly. And Rukmi was able to spot the lonely chariot carrying his sister and her objector. So he came near, side by side, and shouted, Stop, you thief! How dare you lay hands on my sister? With three arrows, Rukmi hit Krishna. 
he went on hurling insult after insult which were hurting which were as sharp as and as wounding as his arrows krishna smiled all the while with six arrows he hit rukmini as four horses were hit by the six arrows charioter was then wounded by one or two more arrows and the flat staff of the chariot was felled by three more rukmini went on with the fight but krishna was unruffled bow after bow was taken by rukmini each one was broken as soon as it was taken Rukmi then took up several other weapons each of them was splintered Rukmi jumped down from his chariot with a sword in his hand he rushed towards Krishna with a desire to kill he looked like a moth rushing madly towards a flame Krishna broke his sword into many pieces he himself took up his sword went towards Rukmi Rukmi to kill him Now what happened? Rukmini was frightened for her brother. She fell at the feet of Krishna and said, "Please do not kill my brother. I beseech you, do not let my brother die." Her form was trembling with fear, and her face was pale. Her voice was faint, and her words were indistinct as she prayed for the life of her brother. Krishna let him off without killing him. He insulted him, however, by disfiguring him. How? Rukmini's locks were cut off, and he shaved off his moustache. <laughs> by this time, the Yadava army led by Balarama came there. Balram took pity on Rukmini and his condition. and said krishna you should not have done this to him no he then spoke words of comfort to rukmini and said in your love for your brother you are upset but believe me there is no need for you to be upset krishna was provoked into insulting your brother you should not think of it any more go with krishna with a happy heart after all your prayers have been answered and rukmini's life has been saved The Yadava host moved towards Dwaraka. Soon, the chariot of Krishna with Garuda flag was seen in the distance, and even that was lost to view. Rukmi stood watching the dust long after the chariot had vanished. He would not go back to the city. He stayed where he was because he had said. i will not come back without killing krishna these are all great characters he didn't go back he stayed there and then he built a city for himself <laughs> and lived there to 26 session lord mahadeva when he had lost sati during the yajna of daksha was lost in meditation and was performing tapasya on himavan sati had been born as the daughter of himavan and she was famed as parvati the daughter of parvata she was bent on becoming the spouse of mahadeva and she was attending on him and serving him he took no notice of her absorbed as he was in the terrace tapas this uh, parvati is none other than sati in another birth the devas had been told that the son born to mahadeva and parvati would be kumara and he would become the commander of the heavenly host indra wanted to precipitate matters he therefore sent kamadeva the god of love to the spot where lord mahadeva was performing intense tapasya now kamadeva is a man no huh? is male is not female kama was attended by vasanta the season of spring 
laden with freshness, with all the flowers which are in the quiver of Kama. The lotus, the Ashoka, the Chuta, the flower of the mango, Navamallika and the blue lotus. Mandanila, the soft breeze from the south, laden with the perfume of mountain flowers, was also with them. When they came to the mountains, the air was balmy. And there was every hope of their mission being achieved. Beautiful atmosphere for Kama they were to attack. Nice smells, beautiful breeze, all kinds of flowers in hand. Parvati was attending on the Lord. Kama shot his arrows of flowers at Lord Mahadeva. His Kamadeva's arrows are very soft, they are flowers. He shot this <laughs> at Lord Mahadeva. He opened his eyes. And they lighted on Parvati. Mahadeva was angry at the thought of his tapas being disturbed. He looked round. And his angry eyes saw Kama, who after doing the deed was trembling. Mahadeva opened his third eye, and out of it streamed forth fire which consumed Kama. What did Rati do? the wife of Kama, went to the Lord and her lamentation was heart-rending. The Lord took pity on her and told her that after his marriage with Parvati, he would see that Kama was restored to her. But Kama would be visible only to her. She then said, My Lord, Will my husband never have a form anymore? Mahadeva thought for a while and said, During Dwapara, Lord Narayana will be born as Krishna. And his son will be your Kama. <laughs> you will be a maid in the house of Shambhara and Asura. There your reunion will take place. According to this prophecy, a son was born to Krishna in Rukmani. This was Kama. The child was named Pradyumna. And great celebrations were on in the city of Dwaraka. Pradyumna was born. Sambara was an Asura who had been told that the child born of Krishna in Rukmani would be his death. He therefore came to Dwaraka, and when he heard about the birth of a child, he decided to hesitate no longer. It was not even ten days since the child was born, when everyone was engaged in some task or the other, Shambhara, who was waiting for his chance, found the child to have been left alone, unattended for a moment. That was enough for him. He stole the child and vanished from the neighborhood of the city. He placed a great distance between himself and the city of Dwaraka. Then he thought of different ways of killing the child. Looking at the beauty of the newborn child, he could not do it himself. Even this man, this dangerous fellow, he looked at this child, he wanted to, he didn't know how to do this, he's looking so nice. Hmm? So he decided to drown it in the sea, so that just put and go away. That way he could avoid seeing the child being killed. The same time, he would be sure that it was dead, therefore he threw the child into the sea and went away to a city with an easy mind. Dwaraka was a city of woe, and Rukmini was inconsolable. But time is a great healer, and gradually people began to forget that there was once a child born to Krishna and Rukmini that was lost to them. 
But what happened? The child which had been thrown into the sea did not die. A large fish thought that it was a morsel of food and swallowed it whole. Fish was caught by a group of fishermen. They found the fish to be so big and unusual that they took it to the king as a gift. King who was Sambara accepted it and it was duly sent to the kitchen to be cooked. Woman in charge of the kitchen was a beautiful girl by name Mayavati. When they cut up the fish, they found a child inside the fish and they told Mayavati about it. She was charmed by the beauty of it and heart was full of compassion for the child. She took it and brought it up as a child. This son was growing up into a handsome boy. Narada came to see her one day. <laughs> Narayana, Narayana. He looked at the young boy and asked Maya, who is this kid? She told him the entire story of fish, finding of the child and so on. Narada heard of everything quietly. He then looked at her and said, Do you remember anything about your past life? No, my lord, said Mayavati, I know nothing. And yet at times I dream. In the dream I feel that I am a goddess and always there are flowers around. I dream that I am wandering among them. By my side is a man, a handsome man, the most handsome man that I have ever seen. But then, before I can find out how it happened, my companion vanishes and I see a heap of ashes by my side. This is the dream that often visits me in my sleep. Can you tell me why it happens? My child said, Narada, it's not a dream, but fragments of your previous births. This was the most tragic event in your life, and so it persists in your memory and haunts you in this life. Tell me, she said, what is it all about? Narada said, Narayana, Narayana. <laughs> you are Rati, said Narada, the wife of Kamadeva. She looked at him with unbelieving eyes. Narada then recounted to her entire story and added, This child you are now bringing up is none other than your Lord Kama. Mahadeva had so ordained it that he should kill Shambhara and then be united with you. Narada left her. Narayana, Narayana. Mayavati was deeply immersed in thought. She knew that the words of the rishis can never be false. She waited for a long time. The little boy should grow up to be a man. When he grew up, she would tell him what he should do. On his entire Bhagavad, apart from Krishna and Balarama, one, two. The next most interesting character is this Narada. <laughs> Wherever there needs to be confusion, he appears. Wherever things have to be explained, he appears. Wherever information has to be gathered, he appears. Where information has to be given, he appears. Why? Because Narada is supposed to be the son of Brahma and one who has attained freedom and moksha and knows what is going to happen next, what is coming now and so on. People mistake him to be a gossiper and carrier of tales. That is the image given. Narada is actually a key person in the Bhagavad. In fact, it was Narada who inspired Vyasa to start doing the Bhagavata. You remember the story, He's telling him, you missed just one thing, even though you wrote the Mahabharata, even though you wrote the Brahma Sutras, 
And one thing you missed, you never talked about the Lord too much. Ah, here and there you mentioned. Which is why you are looking so sad. Hmm? So, change your mind a bit. So, therefore, Bhagavatam is read by Vedantins so that the minds become compassionate and melt and the heart moves and will grows where the brain was growing at one time. So the key factor is Narad. And look, he comes playing the Veena, the divine Veena, the sound of the Veena, and then comes Narad. So don't mistake Narad for that person. <laughs> Time rolled on, slowly for Mayavati. A time of waiting came to end, finally. The young boy now reached manhood and his beauty was captivating. He had inherited his father's long eyes, eyes like the petals of a lotus. His arms were long and his smile was like that of Krishna. Mayavati loved him. It was evident to the young man that with every action, with every lift of her eyebrows, with her smiles, she was expressing her love for him and questioning him silently if he would accept her love. One day he came to her and said, This behavior of yours is puzzling. You have brought me up since I was a child. You have been a mother to me. All these days and all these years, it has been like that. Now, all of a sudden, Narada has whispered, all of a sudden, you do not seem to think of me as your son. <laughs> In fact, your eyes make your intentions clear. Please do not embarrass me. Please forget these thoughts which are unbecoming of you. Who has planted this thought? Narada. Mayavati told him about herself and about him. She said, you are born to Krishna in the house of the Yadavas. Rukmini is your mother. Sambara stole you from your mother's side. With the intentions of destroying you, he threw you into the sea. A fish swallowed you and so on. I have taken care of you all these years. The sage Narada, the son of Brahma, told me all this. You must kill Shambhara, who is past master in the art of fighting, with the help of Maya. Your mother has never forgotten a child whom she lost when he was a week old only. Please do not worry about how you are going to kill Shambhara. I know the art of Maya and I will teach you. So she taught him the mantra by name Mahamaya. Don't ask for it. <laughs> Pratyumna then challenged Sambara to fight with him. Taken by surprise at the courage of this youngster who was calling him such insulting names. Sambara came out with his maze uplifted. The fight between the two was long and fierce. Surprised by the prowess of the young man, Sambara decided to use his powers of Maya. And the fight became more intense. None of the guiles of Sambara were effective against the young adversary. Pradyumna proved to be superior to him in every way. Finally, Pradyumna took up his sword and cut off the head of Sambal. <laughs> Monkeys. Mayavati, who could fly in the air, 
carried Pradyumna to the city of Dwaraka. She led him to the palace of Krishna. The servants, attendants, maids and others who were busy with their daily task saw a young man enter with a very beautiful woman. The youngster was in every way like Lord Krishna and they thought for a while it was Krishna. And they were speculating as to who is the woman. It took them some time to realize that he was not Krishna. Each one was asking the other, who is this young man? Rukmini heard about the arrival of a young couple and she came to see who they were. When she saw him, her eyes filled with tears. She said to herself, if my child had been alive, he would have been just like this young man. I wonder who he is. It is strange that he should resemble my Lord so much. Can it be my son, who was considered lost? She was still considering the newcomers, likeliness to Krishna and wondering about who he was and why he had come here when Krishna came there with Vasudeva and Devaki. Now, she had a doubt what about Krishna? He did not have, he knows, he knew everything and stood there, but Krishna appeared. He knew everything, but he stood there as though he knew nothing. Mayavati was about to speak when Narada came on the scene. Again, Narayana, Narayana, and cleared all their doubts. Pradyumna was embraced by everyone, and Mayavati found herself in the arms of Rukmini. Rukmini proudly announced that a son that was lost was found again, as though he died and his life was granted back. Soon the entire city came to see their young prince and there was joy in the hearts of everyone. It seemed as though the child had been born only then, at that very moment. So great was the excitement in Dwaraka. One of the kinsmen of Krishna was Shatrajit. He was a bhakta of Surya. And in fact, Surya considered him as one of his friends and not just a bhakta. One Surya, in a happy frame of mind, said, Chatrajit, my friend, I would like to give you a costly gem as a gift. Please take it. It will give you immense fortune. So say, Surya gave the jewel by name Shamantaka to Shatrajit. This jewel was as dazzling as the sun himself. And when Shatrajit entered the city wearing the jewel on his neck, the people thought that the sun had come to the earth. He then showed it to everyone proudly. There was some special quality about the jewel. It would yield 12 mons of gold every day to the owner. You just had to keep it there. That means within two years you will have more money than the royal vault in England. Every day it would give you twelve mons of gold to the owner. When the people saw the jewel and the glow of it, they went to Krishna and said, Krishna, please come. Listen to this wonderful news. The sun has come down to earth. Even now he is walking towards the palace to visit you. Our eyes are hurting, dazzled as we are by the glow of the sun. Krishna laughed at the ignorance of the people and said, It is not the sun. It is Shatrajit wearing a jewel given to him by the sun. 
After showing the jewel to all his kinsmen, Chatrajit took the jewel to his puja room and placed it in the sanctified place. Fame of the gem spread far and wide. It was said that there would be no more famine or poverty in the place where the jewel was worshipped. Every day twelve bonds of gold will be found near the jewel. And Shatrijit became very rich. Now what happens when you become very rich? He also became very arrogant. One day, Krishna had been to the house of Shatrijit. During the conversation, Krishna said, It is said that the place where this jewel is placed will not have poverty, nor will there be famine in the country. It is said to avert accidental deaths and also diseases. The mind, I have been told, will always be tranquil and bodily pains will not be felt. Evil portents will not be seen, nor there will be deceit or theft. Considering all this, it is to my mind a good idea that you leave this gem with King Ugrasena so that the entire country will benefit by the grace of Surya, not just you and your family. Good suggestion. Chatrajit had become too arrogant. Every day is getting twelve mons of gold. Hmm? And again he had become too fond of money. He laughed at Krishna and said, This was given to me by Surya as a keepsake, as a token of our dear friendship. If you want a similar jewel, pray to him and he may grant you one. Who knows? Krishna said nothing after that. Matter ended. Or so they thought. Some days later, one day, Prasenajit, the brother of Satrajit, asked his brother if he could wear the jewel for a day. Brother agreed to it. Prasenajit went out to hunt with the jewel on his neck. Sun had set. He did not come home. Satrajit worried about him. And perhaps more about his jewel, waited impatiently for the night to pass. Day dawned. No sign of Prasenajit. Satrajit was extremely worried. He went to the forest with a search party. There in the heart of the dense forest, they found the dead body of the horse he had been riding. They went further and there they found the lifeless body of Prasenajit. They brought him home. Sure enough, the jewel was not to be found. Sad and angry at the death of his brother, Shatrajit told someone, My brother has been killed. It is because someone wanted the Shamantaka. That someone wanted to possess it. Some days back, Krishna had come here. <laughs> he asked me to give the gem to his grandfather. I refused. Because of that, Krishna must have been angry. I am sure it is his doing. He has killed my brother and taken the shaman taka, I am sure of it. He must have stolen the gem. The accusation was passed on from lip to lip. Mm, finally, he reached the ears of Krishna. At first, he was amused. But he realized that people are apt to believe anything ill of others, even of their beloved Krishna. He was anxious to vindicate his honor in the eyes of his people. He collected a crowd of his friends and went to the forest to find a clue to the death of Prasenajit. He went to the spot where Prasenajit was found dead. In their eagerness to take the body home, Shatrajit and others had not tried to look around and see what had happened. Krishna looked around near the spot where Prasanna was found dead. He saw the tracks of a lion 
and they were leading away from the pug marks. They were to be found for quite some distance and Krishna could see that there were signs of blood in the tracks. He now followed the tracks and after quite some distance they stopped. Krishna and his companions found a dead lion. They searched the lion but could not find the jewel there. They saw, however, signs of a struggle and found that a bear and a lion had fought there and the lion had been killed by the bear. Krishna now had to follow the tracks made by the bear and he soon found himself at the mouth of an immense cave. He asked his companions to stay outside and went inside alone to see if the bear was there. Most important, to see if Shyamantaka, the jewel, was there. Krishna stood at the entrance of the cave and looked. He did not have to see twice to find out if the jewel was there. A child was crawling on the ground. In its hand was the jewel. For a moment he stood as though spellbound. Then he went near the child to take the jewel from his hands. The mother bear was nearby. When she saw a human being approaching a child, she let out a frightened cry. In a moment, the big bear, as old as time, came near Krishna. Finding that the stranger was trying to snatch the jewel from the hands of the child, bear tried to attack Krishna. Now that bear was Jambavan. The bear which played such a great part during the war which Sri Rama fought with Ravana during the Treta Yuga. He was a Chiranjeevi. Means he'll never die. And he was dwelling in this cave. Krishna knew who he was. But the fight began. And it went on. This is something that he knows. Tikhai. Carry on. Twenty-eight days and twenty-eight nights it went on. Finding the opponent so powerful, Jambavan was really amazed and he said, I have so far seen only one person who was as skillful and as powerful as you in fighting. Krishna innocently asked, and who was that? Jambavan said, Perhaps you might not have heard of him. He belonged to a generation which was far earlier than yours. His name was Rama and he was a prince of the rays of the sun. He was a great fighter and he killed the Rakshasa Ravana. Is he the same Rama? who wept for ten months since his wife was carried away by the Rakshasa Ravana. I have been told that he was banished to the forest by his stepmother and with his wife and his brother he walked the forest for years together. I personally do not think very highly of it. <laughs> said Krishna with a deliberate sneer. Jambavan's anger knew no bounds. <laughs> he said, how dare you talk so disparagingly of my Lord? He was Lord Narayana himself who had been born on the earth for the suppression of Adharma and have the impertinence to say that you do not think very highly of him. Evidently you think too highly of yourself. Jambavan attacked him once again. Krishna proved to be more powerful and Jambavan fell down in a faint. He opened his eyes after a while and looked up. And what did he see? He saw Rama with the famed Kodanda in his hand. With a smile on his face, Rama said, Jambavan. Jambavan fell at his feet and said, My Lord, 
my eyes have been aching for a sight of you for this many a day and today you've come before me. I thought you had forgotten your promise to me that I would see you in the Dwapara Yuga. You have in your infinite mercy come to me to feast my eyes. Yambavan wiped his tears, which were eyes which were full of tears and looked again. He could not see Rama, but he saw instead his enemy with whom he had been fighting all these days. Where is my Rama? He kept on asking and searched all over the cave and came back to the spot where Krishna was. He looked and saw that it was Rama. A moment he would look away and Krishna would be there. After a while, Rama would be there. Finally, Jambavan said, Rama, I don't know what has happened. Please tell me why you are confusing me like this. Why do you make me confuse you with this man who has been impertinent enough to talk ill of you? He was seeing Rama, even as he was seeing Rama, Rama changed into Krishna and again into Rama. And Rama said, I am Krishna. This is the avatara for the Dwapara Yuga to uphold Dharma. I promised to you that I would grant you my darshan when I took leave of you and I wanted you to know that I am now the son of the Yadava house. I am the son of Vasudeva and I came here to take the jewel and restore it to the owner. He told Jambavan about the very urgent need he had to take the jewel back. People were blaming him for stealing it. He has stolen butter, he has stolen hearts. He didn't steal this gem. <laughs> Jambavan paid homage to him and gave him the jewel. With it, he also gave his daughter Jambavati to him. He asked Krishna to honor him by accepting his daughter and Krishna accepted her gladly. Jambavati was added on. Krishna took leave of Jambavan and returned to Dwaraka with Jambavati and the jewel. Companions of Krishna in the meantime waited for twelve days and nights at the entrance of the cave. They were all outside. They heard the fighting and finally they thought Krishna had been killed. So they returned to the city with the news that Krishna had been vanquished in a fight with a wild animal. They didn't see which. Great was the woe in Dwaraka. Everybody was cursing Satrajit for wrongly accusing Krishna of the theft and thus causing his death. They all went to the temple of Devi Durga and prayed to her to give them some hope that Krishna was not dead. At the conclusion of the puja, she spoke the words, You will all see Krishna very soon. When their prayers were over, they merged out of the temple and found that the prayers were answered by the Devi. They saw Krishna with the jewel glowing on his neck. By his side stood a beautiful maiden. He said, Please let everyone assemble in the king's hall. Please ask Shatrajit also to be present. I will be there soon. In the great hall named Sudharma, in the presence of everyone, Krishna stood up and related to them the truth about Prasnajit and the later happenings. He then took the disputed jewel Shamantaka and placed it on the neck of Shatraji and said, Now I am vindicated. I am freed of the stigma which you attach to my name. But the stigma of stealing butter never went. The stigma of stealing hearts never went. Shamantaka. Shatraji was so ashamed of himself that he could not hold up his head. So he walked out of the hall. He was extremely unhappy. He said, What shall I do to please Krishna and make him forget this incident? 
how can I wipe out the unpopularity which I am suffering now because of my thoughtless words and action? Finally, he decided that the only way to please Krishna and to make amends for all the unpleasantness of the few months would be to give his daughter Satya Bama to him. <laughs> hmm? During the wedding, Chatrajit gave the gem to Krishna. Krishna refused to take it. He said, Surya gave it to you. It is but right that you should have it. Believe me, it is not out of pick that I am saying these words. You had two jewels and you have given me the better of the two. <laughs> he smiled at Bama, whose face was suffused with her blush. Satibama was a very beautiful girl and all the young men of the Vrishni, Andaka and Yadava houses had been a little in love with her. Chief among them was Kritavarma, the son of Hridika. He had asked Shatrajit for her hand once, but the father had not given a proper reply. But then, Shatrajit, in a moment of generosity, had given her to Krishna as a peace offering. Krishna was very pleased to take her hand. As for Satyabhama, she was only too happy to have Krishna as a Lord. 2.31 Krishna had been following the fortunes of the Pandavas. He knew that they were very badly treated by the old king and his sons, but he was not prepared for the terrible news which reached him. News came to Dwaraka that the Pandavas, with their mother Kunti, were spending a year in the city by name Varnavata at the wish of Dhritarashtra. When the year was nearly over, the palace in which they were staying had caught fire and all of them destroyed by the fire. The dead and charred bodies were found. People said that the palace had been built especially for the stay of the Pandavas. That Purochana, the architect, was a favored friend of the sons of the Dharashtra. Therefore, he did not get a fireproof certificate. <laughs> he had used inflammable material like lac and wax for building the palace in Varnavata. Krishna and Balarama went to Hastina to offer their condolences to Bhishma and Dhritarashtra and Vidura and others. The blind king Dhritarashtra pretended to be unhappy. They had to look as though they believed him. Bhishma was very unhappy and he was heartbroken. So was Drona, whose favorite pupil was Arjuna, the Pandava. Krishna saw that Vidura did not look as sad as he should have done and he guessed that the Pandavas had escaped from the fire. They were hiding somewhere. But then, he was not supposed to know about it, right? And so the sad scene went on. The whole book, drama is that. I know everything, I don't know anything. <laughs> this is the drama of Bhagavad. So the drama went on, the sad scene. Dhritarashtra shedding tears profusely and saying, Oh, my dear nephew, oh, my dear Yudhishthira, how can I bear this grief? Duryodhana, standing quietly, he did not pretend to be unhappy or broken hearted. Very clear. But his hatred for the Pandavas was well known. And it would have looked odd, thought Krishna, if he did look sad. While Krishna and Balarama were in Hastinapura, a terrible intrigue was going on in Dwaraka. 
Kritavarman had not forgiven Shatrajit for having given Satyabhama to Krishna. Shatrajit had given him hopes that she should be given to him. Kritavarma, though not in words and now in a sudden impulse, fit he had given her away to Krishna. Another suitor to the hand of Satyabhama was Shatadhanva another Yadava. Surprisingly enough, the one to back up Kritavarma was none other than Akrura, who had once been a devotee of Krishna. Such is the power of wealth and avarice. The desire to possess the jewel blinded even this saintly man, who had once seen Krishna and Balarama as incarnations of Lord Narayan and Adishesha. Sad indeed is the lure of gold which can dazzle even men like Akrura. Akrura, incidentally, was also an aspirant for the hand of Satyabhama. That was also there. Not just the money. Kritavarman and Akrura approached Shatadhanva and with a dastardly plan, they said, Look, this Shatrajit has deceived all of us. He had promised his daughter to one of us and suddenly gives her away to this Krishna. Is it right? It is right that we should punish him. The time is ripe since Krishna and Rama are away in Hastinapura. Why should we not kill him and make him join his brother Prasanjit? The sinful-minded Shatadhanva, who could easily be led into evil paths, agreed readily. During the night when Shatrajit was sleeping, Shatadhanva killed him and grabbing the jewel ran away from there like a thief. Women in the house found Shatrajit killed and there was a wail of woe which rose to the heavens. Satyabhama was extremely fond of her father and she was inconsolable. She insisted on the body of her father to be preserved in oil and went all the way to Hastina to tell Krishna about it. She said, Krishna has to see this. Krishna was horrified at the terrible deed that had been done by the jealous men in Dwaraka. He pacified Satyabhama as best as he could. He said he would avenge the death of a father and he rushed back to Dwaraka with the intention of eliminating Shatadhanva. Hearing that Krishna was coming back to Dwaraka with wrathful eyes which were spitting fire, Shatadhanva went to Kritavarma and said, You are the one who instigated me to do this dreadful thing. Hmm? It is up to you to save me from the fury of Krishna. Pritavarman could not accede to his request. He said, I dare not oppose the terrible brothers and lose my life. I have been told that they are incarnations of God. I will not do anything to displace them. They are too powerful. Kamsa lost his life at the hands of Krishna, who was still a young boy. And have you not heard how the brothers defeated Jarasandha by destroying his army again and again? I can do nothing to help you. Chattadhanva was shocked by the behavior of Kartavarman, who was the one who had made him commit the terrible crime in the first place. But he had no time even to quarrel with him. He asked Akrura to aid him in his hour of need. He too proved a broken reed. Akrura suddenly became sanctimonious and God-fearing. Suddenly, perhaps it was a pose he assumed, or perhaps it was because he was repenting for his lapse. Shatadhana could not make out what made him talk like that. Akrura said, Look, my friend, which man in his proper senses will invite the anger of the terrible brothers? Krishna is the Lord of Lords, He is the Parabrahman, He is the Creator, the Preserver and Destroyer of this Universe. 
I know who he is and I now salute him. Akrura closed his eyes and it seemed as though he was lost in meditation. Poor Shatadhanva did not know what he should do. He said nothing. He placed the jewel in Akrura's lap and jumping on a horse which would cover a hundred yojanas a day, fled from the spot as fast as he could. He said, now let him have it. I am going, I can't do this. Balrama and Krishna followed him in the chariot which Daruka was driving. When he reached the outskirts of Mithila and the gardens cutting the city, Shatadhanva's horse fell down dead. Leaving it there, he began to run desperately. Krishna jumped down from his chariot and ran after him. He caught up with him very soon and using his chakra, he cut off his head. When he was dead, Krishna looked for the jewel among his clothes and could not find it. Went back to his brother and said, this was unnecessary. Killing <laughs> of the shattered dhanva. The jewel is not with him. Balrama said, do not acquit him so easily, Krishna. We know that he killed Shatrajit and the culprit has been punished. You did no wrong. As for the killing of Bhama's father, was for the sake of the jewel, Shamantaka. I am sure the sinner has left it in somebody's charge, in the city. Go back to Dwaraka and look for it. As for me, now that we have come this far, I would like to see my friend, the king of Videha, and then return to Dwaraka. Balrama entered Videha and proceeded towards the king's palace. Krishna hurried back to the city and went to Satyabhama. He told her that he had killed Shatadhanva, avenged the killing of her father, but the jewel could not be found. Chattrajit had no sons, so Krishna took care of the final rites for the dead man. After all the ceremonies were over, Krishna began making enquiries about the missing jewel. He found out that Kritavarma and Akrura, the instigators of the crime, had run away from Dwaraka. Course of time, the story of Shatrajit and the ill-fated gem Shamantaka which brought nothing but misfortune to the one who possessed it, became an old story. Everyone began to think less and less of it. Finally, no one spoke of it. Hari Narayana. Gurubhyo Namaha Hari Om. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Gopika Jeevana Smaranam Hari Narayana